Hi, this is William Sodi. I'm the author of the highly acclaimed book, From CO to CEO, a practical guide for transitioning from military to industry leadership. And I consult with companies on how to develop programs to improve the effectiveness of their veteran employees. During the show, we will be talking about why companies should stop saying thank you for your service and instead create meaningful programs to activate terrific veteran resources, why veterans who are used to signing up for long-term employment in the military, on average, last less than two years in their first civilian job, and how companies can do more than just hiring veterans, how they turn these wonderful assets into fiercely loyal employees who are mission-driven. Stay tuned. Welcome back to part two of our delicious conversation with retired Captain William Toti, T-O-T-I. There you go. <laughs> and uh, you can find him at williamtoti.com. And listen, in part one, if you didn't hear part one of the show, you definitely got to go back. There was some, I mean, it was meaty. There was some really good value in there. We talked about why thank you for your service often just falls flat on its face particularly when we are leaders, when we are uh, the people who hire veterans, we have, we want to hire them with our greatest intentions to to honor and serve these people. And yet so often there's a lot missing in what we're doing and we end up having to fire these people who we really hoped would be phenomenal leaders. And now in part one of the show, I talked with Bill about, you know, these, difficult conversations that often happen as a result of not really thinking through what's happening. We talked about what's happening in government, what's happening in uh, the military, and who's training these people who are exiting the military and the false expectations they're given. But those false expectations also fall on us as leaders, and we start to drop the ball. Um, And this book, his book, From CO, Commanding Officer, to CEO is a practical guide for transitioning from military to industry leadership. Now, to be clear here, this is not just a book for vets. This is very much, this is why I wanted to have you, uh, have Bill on, is because this is very much a book for leaders to understand that transition and where our part is and what we need to do. So let me give you an example because I think it will, it's a dramatic one, but I think it will help. Um, if you are a decent human being, you don't use the N word. Of course you don't, right? Why would you? It makes no sense to use that word. Yet, if you listen to any black rap, you hear that word all the time. And if you watch, um, any TV shows with two uh, black guys talking to each other, they're using the N-word. So why is it okay for them and not for us? Because there's an understanding of context that doesn't exist between a white person or a non-black person and uh, with a black person. There's a context difference. Now think about that for a minute. I know it's an extreme example, but I want you to grasp that for a minute. There's a conversation that can only go on between two people of the same culture and be grasped. By anybody else, it's lost context. So in the beginning of Bill's book, when you're reading it, there's a context of a conversation between two vets, one who has been out of it, been out of the military and gone out into the corporate business industry world, and another one who's transitioning out. And you might read that and go, is this book for me or is it for a vet? It is. It's for both of you. But it's letting you eavesdrop in on a conversation that you would never be able to have, just like you'd never be able to call the N-word. You'd never be able to have that conversation and have it land. This conversation gives you the context of what's really going on on the other side. So you really, so it gives you that, that it's like having a magic translator into the military language and how it needs to be delivered. And it probably can only be delivered by somebody who really understands that world. So I, that's why I'm one of the reasons I want to encourage you to get the book, take your time and read it. It's also out on audio, isn't it? It is. Yes. 
Yeah, so you can get it on audiobook too. So it's it's a great way for you to grasp that. So so let's jump into let's jump into that. Um, <laughs> you know, you like I said, you come from this military background. You um, you went into into the industry world. You spent fifteen years climbing that ladder. You even had to fire a general uh, as part of your quote leadership development. You've also been featured in several uh, global release documentaries. Tell us a little bit about that. How the heck did that happen, and where does that fall? Well, the, um, the, the of course they're not related to the book, but no, um, but it's still fascinating. Yeah. It's interesting about you. The two kind of life experiences I've had, which one I would consider a positive, and the other one a negative. Uh, the positive one is uh, I've been since I was captain of the submarine USS Indianapolis. I've been associated with the World War II cruiser survivors. Uh, if you've seen Jaws, you've heard the story of that world of USS Indianapolis since the mid 1990s. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in the year 2000 exoneration of their captain. He had been court martialed in 1945. So my the three of the six global release documentaries have to do with that whole. Mm -hmm. transpiration of events and my involvement with uh World what War was II your involvement group. though specifically well when i when we were decommissioning my submarine i actually invited the crew of the world war ii cruisers the survivors of the world war ii cruiser they'd been torpedoed by a japanese submarine and so on to my decommissioning ceremony where i got buttonholed by two of them they they were trying to get their captain exonerated from the court martial he's court martialed for ship being sunk in 1945. And they've been working since 1960 or so on exonerating their captain. And, and because I was a submarine captain, they said, if anyone can help us get this thing done, it's you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they guilted me into helping them. Not, <laughs> not, not that I didn't want to help them, but I didn't know what I could do, right? And I right. didn't want to overpromise. And it turns out I was able to demonstrate to computer modeling, which didn't exist in 1945, of course. During the time he was court-martialed, that even if he had been zigzagging, he would have still been sunk. Mm. So that was my contribution to that story, and um, and he was exonerated by act of Congress, and and I had the op honor of entering the exoneration language into the captain's service record in two thousand one May May of two thousand one, and so that was kind of episode number one of my life that caused you know, three documentaries. Um, one point I forgot to mention was that captain did commit suicide on November 6, 1968. Sad footnote to that sordid story and, and wasn't exonerated until 2000. So, but his son, one of his sons was still alive to learn about it when that happened. The second event occurred a few months after I entered McVeigh's exoneration into his service record was 9-11. I was in the Pentagon when the plane hit us mm -hmm. and I survived many of my um, shipmates and friends did not. And, um, but as it so happened that day, you know, as I was trying to help rescue people on the outside of the building at the point of impact, the airplane, there was an ABC news cameraman who was filming and you could see me running around like a crazy man and back and forth trying to do what I could. And, and because I, I exist in that film, and they were able to identify who I was. So basically, every time a documentary occurs about 9-11 of the Pentagon, I'm one guy that they go to, to to try to get in there. Not a not a happy day, not a good time. In fact, I struggled with uh, saying yes the first time uh, to that uh, request to you know be in the documentary, but. Um, the, the one that came out last year, which was the sixth part on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, National Geographic, um, it was called 9-11, um, One Day in America, mm -hmm. that award-winning documentary uh, that I'm the only guy from the Pentagon in that documentary. And so it, it rightly focused on the on New York, and sure. I have no issues with that. They, no. they had majority of the, of the fatalities and the spotlight should be on them, but I was disappointed that only six minutes of a six-hour documentary 
focused on the Pentagon. And I thought that was a little underrepresented, but mm -hmm. it is what it is, right? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you were talking about the exoneration of this, this captain, mm -hmm. and, and you talked about, you know, so he was court-martialed. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. And he ended up suiciding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, what a great lesson in leadership. And it was oh, failure to transition. I mean, he, he, the court martial was 1945. He didn't kill himself till 68. But there was a whole bunch of issues. He was not happy with his work. Um, he kept getting hate letters from family members of people who did not survive the sinking of the ship. Of course. Because after all, the Navy seemed to blame him for the sinking. Why should they feel otherwise? So I think after 20 years of getting these this hate mail from 45 to 65, he realized this is never going to stop. Yeah. Um, this is never going to get better. And in 68, he ended up killing himself. Very but sad. Again, because I felt issue of transition, isn't it? Yeah, I talk about this in my book, by the way, from CEO to CEO. You say, what does that have to do with this story? It has to do with moral courage and trying to do the right thing. Because I was really under a lot of pressure from the Navy. I was an active duty Navy captain, the commander, yeah. and then captain when I was working on exoneration of this guy. And basically trying to argue the Navy screwed up in the court martial to begin with. And I was told in no uncertain terms that I, if I wanted to keep getting promoted, I needed to learn how to be a, here's the expression that was used, a company man. Right. And, and they were you know, basically back off, stand down. You, you don't seek the spotlight. I wasn't seeking a spotlight, by the way, I was just trying to right or wrong. Uh, or, you know, this may not go well for you. I ended up deciding to leave the Navy rather than stick around for Admiral, not because of this warning, but because I realized I needed to leave young enough to have a viable full second career in industry, which I wanted to do. And if I'd stayed in for Admiral, you know, I wouldn't have had enough time left in my life to right. have a real second career. But there's a, there's a lot of lessons in all of that. But again, you know, this is this example of what we talked about, about transitions, but also about courage, because, you know, many times, you know, this bill on this show, we talk a lot about mm. there is no leadership without courage. It right. just doesn't exist, you know, without real willingness to step into deep levels of courage, you cannot lead. You are just, you're an empty suit. And mm -hmm. so... That means you got to be willing to take risk and risk is not just as in, well, we're going to do this project, but often the risk is to stand up for somebody or to stand up for something that you believe matters mm -hmm. when others are shouting you down. I mean, so I, you know, I think that's a very important part of this show for people to get. Here's a book about from CEO to CEO, but also the, Sometimes you have to take an act of great courage to really lead. And again, you might think that a veteran would be naturally courageous, but hold on a second, because here's a veteran being courageous and told, be a company man. Exactly. Right? And no, we don't want that kind of courage. And that's a great segue, because one of the things I talk about in the book is the need for the veteran to find, quote, the mission, unquote, the mission, in their right. civilian career, right? Because being, a, being in the military is self-actualizing as far as the mission goes. You're defending the country. Yes. And you can, you can find reasons to feel good about yourself. There are stereotypes on both sides, on, on the so corporate side of what the veteran is going to be like, and on the veteran side of what company is going to be like. A mm -hmm. lot of veterans swallow the stereotype that their new mission is going to be to put money in their boss's pocket. And I talk about that in the book about how wrong that is. And there's a new, and there's a new form of courage. It's good that you're not going to be shot at in your new job, right? In your new career, be happy about that. But that doesn't mean you, you, you don't need courage. It may be a different form of courage, but you're still going to need courage because you may be, Doing the right thing may risk your income, 
your mortgage, your family's well-being, those are no less true on the civilian side than they were on active duty. And, and the company leaders who read my book need to help the military person find that mission. And that's one of those things that will motivate them to do well for you. So I know you do that. You go through that in the book. And I want, again, I want to encourage people to do that. But give us, a, give us, can you give us an example or, or maybe a story of somebody you've been able to, to show that with where they've been able to, you know, they're kind of floundering and you've been able to show them or they've been able to find the mission in this, what might seem futile thing they're doing? Well, even in the introduction of the book, I'd, I'd speak about the defense industry specifically, but it, it's an example, like you're saying. If you don't, if we don't allow people, if we don't enable folks to transition effectively from active duty, where they've used all these plane ships, weapon systems, to the industry that builds them, then the, the industry will be less effective at designing things that actually work. So that, that's one very obvious, concrete example of finding the mission. But even if you're not in the defense industry, and part of my job, I was worked for Hewlett Packard in my civilian right. practice. And it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity because you're enabling people to do things they would not otherwise be able to do. And the, the mission may look different than what you expected it to look like, mm -hmm. but from the global performance standpoint, it's no less important um, than many of the missions that active duty folks do. And remember, not everybody is holding a gun who's on active duty. And so for, for many of the people, the, the, the mission they're doing in the civilian <clears throat> industry may actually be more impactful than what they were doing on active duty. And again, that's the thing a, mil a veteran can say to another veteran, that if a non-served corporate leader said to them, the, the veteran may, may not receive that message right. Mm. So help them to find the mission for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a company that you're aware of or an organization that you're aware of who are doing it right? In, in global terms, the answer is sadly no. There are really? pockets of, there are individuals within co companies that own little areas of business that in that little area of business, they're doing it right. Mm. And companies are starting to uh, get more global with respect to veteran hiring strategies. They may have a, a veteran hiring manager or a strategic veteran strategic leader or something like that. And they're doing a good job hiring veterans. And every every company on the planet is going to be proud and they're going to you know, beat their chest about how many veterans they've hired. Yep. But then when you ask them, okay, how many of those veterans are still with you after five years? Their voice kind of drops, right? Because they have no idea. Because they don't track the success of those veterans globally. They track the number that they hire and they and they put that on a sign. That's the banner. Yeah. What a good banner, right? What what a great company we are. Look at all the veterans we're hiring. Yeah, but most of them aren't lasting two years. What are you doing about that? Well, that's so because, is that is that the, is that the is that the timeline? Yeah, about two. Yeah, years? it's less than two years. Ten months is the average wow. turnover for veterans entering. Ten for months. The first yes. Mm -hmm. Think so, about all the from a resource like, standpoint. Think about all the waste. Well, that goes you know, I, again, in. Uh, in my book, Fiercely Low, we talked about the average millennial having a, a career of four years and a job 1.2 years, mm -hmm. right? And that that's very expensive for an organization. But when you have a vet coming in who signed up for a minimum of four years, mm -hmm. right? Who's likely have, you know, so they know how to commit to something and they're walking away after 10 months. Like what? Like hold on a second, let's just take a pause there and say, where's that on us? Mm -hmm. Like if these are people who've demonstrated clearly that they can stick to it and they're walking away after 10 months, what Working the hell are we you. doing Exactly to push them out of the door? Because something's going on. What if we took some accountability to that? That's pretty, like that's a really important point there, Bill. Thank you for bringing that up because I think 
the, the you know we it's easy it's always easy for us to to other well it's mm -hmm. them right you know it's them They're, well mm -hmm. hold on a second if it's them mm -hmm. and they signed up for four years some of them eight or 16 years whatever it was yeah how come you can't keep them a bloody year no exactly like it does the... this place suck that bad and the answer is not that they necessarily suck that bad but they don't bring them in and this is what i was talking about about belonging they don't bring them in so they come in with a false expectation that's theirs we have a false expectation that's ours mm -hmm. and never show the two meet yeah in the book i call that impedance mismatch the company impedance and the employee mismatch has a different idea of what it is that the other is going to do for them. And, you know, the just as I say to the vet, veteran, if your crew is abandoning ship, that's on you. When you're in your yes. civilian job, it's, it's a failure of your leadership. Absolutely. Same is true for the company. If, if veterans are leaving after two, just short of five, two years on average, that's on you. That's because you didn't take ownership for their success. And don't don't you owe it to them to do that after what they've done for you. And rather than say, thank you for your service, do something meaningful and help them understand how to succeed. Because again, the, I believe from a patriotic standpoint, whether in Canada, United States, whatever country you're in, you owe it to them mm -hmm. to help them, right? It's not just a, we're gonna hire you and then throw you out the window when you fail to transition properly, we're going to, you need to understand you throw them in the deep end. Some are going to know, some are going to figure out how to swim. Others are not. Yeah. A lot of them are going to drown in that process. Mm -hmm. So in simple terms, what's the number one thing the company hiring the individual can do? You know, so, you know, I've hired this person who's been a vet for whatever the period of time was. They've got, I now know because I've listened to, to Bill on Dove's show talking about how I've got some illusions about them. They've got some illusions about us. What's the number one thing I can do beyond wanting to brag about we're hiring vets? Mm -hmm. What can I do to make this work? Uh, understand that what the veterans taught when they leave the service is probably going to lead them in the wrong direction. Sit down, have that conversation with them. You would you call it reboot, right? Reboot what they think they know about their new environment and world. And just like, you know, when I was CEO, we really did try to help the person sweeping the floor understand what their role was in the company's success that veteran needs to understand what their role is in the company's success and how that success is measured and what the veteran can do to add to the success. And, you know, if I could give a quick example, we, we had a, I had a situation where there's a very senior retired military person brought into the company in a pseudo advisory kind of preparatory P and L leadership role. If they, if they transitioned well and they acclimated well to the company, they were going to given, be given some p uh, responsibility. And after 10 months with the company, they still didn't understand the, the importance of winning, uh, performing profitably. Right? They, they believed that as long as we were employing good people, covering our heads and things like that, that, um, that, that we were succeeding. And they didn't understand the concept of capital and how capital will migrate from places that are not earning profit to places that are earning profit and and how that would be detrimental to our future right and how how you can Im impact that and and the ceo i wasn't the ceo at this point in my career the ceo i remember him saying very clearly if that dude has been around here for 10 months and he still doesn't understand that we're not just here to hire people then he's not trainable and so and then i said to myself did anybody ever sit down with a guy and have that conversation with them? Mm. And it became very clear that nobody had. And right. so, you know, I, I, I took it upon myself to have that conversation with him. And it became a economics 101 kind of conversation, which this dude had an MBA, 
right? And he was so proud of his MBA. He got it while he was on active duty. And I said, the MBA is up is absolutely worthless for you right now because you're going to get fired. MBA or not, you're about to get fired. So you got to figure out what real economics are as opposed to the economics you might have learned in graduate school. And and this is the conversation we were having. Yeah, and I think that whether you're a military person or not, that's an, that's an argument that often comes up. Absolutely. Right? There's a lot of companies saying, I don't want you if you've got an MBA because of that, because you, you're theoretical rather than boots on the ground. And yet, I, I have dozens, if not hundreds, of transitioning veterans who are taking time at night, to, at night school to get their MBA because they think that that's going to be good t- preparation for them to go into business. I keep trying to talk them off off the you know off the ledge. Off the ledge. Don't do that. It's not right. going to help. Your, your employer will want you to have two more years, or or even worse, they get out of the military, go to night, go to day school get an MBA because they think that's going to help them in their civilian role. And I'll say, look, any employer with assault would rather you have two years in their company rather than that MBA, unless you're yeah. going to be in finance or m and And I don't think you're going to get hired into that kind of job out of the military. So yeah, there's a lot of retraining that needs to happen. So as we come to the end of part two of this conversation, Um, I asked you what a company can do, you know, what's the one thing they can do? Um, what can the vet do? And actually, I'm going to ask you in two parts. What can the vet do who's already in an organization? And what can the vet do who's, who's transitioning right now into industry? So even if you're already in an organization, it's not too late to learn. It took me three years or so to figure out that I was heading down the wrong path when I was in my civilian job. So, you know, the the easy answer is read the book because, uh, you know, that that is a accelerated learning all what I learned in three years. You can learn in a couple of days by reading the book Um, because I learned it the hard way. It almost lost my job in the process of learning it. Um, So that's point number one. Somebody who's get, who's about to get out, the, the mistake I see most people making is they think anybody in industry is a resource they could tap into. And, and so they'll take advice from people they should not be taking advice. And I'll say, where do you want to be in, let's just say, five years? Sure. Is the person you're talking to at that point, are they there? Mm. Or are they still trying to achieve it? Because... Too often, you'll see a veteran leave service after six years, 30 years later, and then they're in the same job. Is that the person you want to be taking advice from? Is that what you want to be doing 30 years from now? The same right. job as when you left? Um, if not, think really hard about who you're getting advice from. I use the analogy, if you want to learn to fly, probably a good idea to talk to a pilot, mm-hmm. right? not, not, not the person at the ticket, aid, uh, ticket counter. So right. be very careful in who you're getting advice from, because I find way too many veterans getting the wrong advice from the wrong people. Yeah, there's a lack of discernment. I mean, I think that discernment is is rare, period, not just with mm-hmm. vets. You know, we tend to go to advice from people who, you know, I always say, if you're going to people for advice that you trust, you're going to fail. And they go, well, you yeah, should go to people who don't trust. No, you should go to people who know what the hell they're talking about. Absolutely. Right. Don't go down on Skid Row and ask for advice on which which stocks to invest in. Mm-hmm. That's not a smart move. Don't go ask the guy who's been divorced four times. Uh, well, how do you make a marriage work? <laughs> right? mm-hmm. Don't ask the person whose kids don't speak to them. You know what's the advice for parenting? Right. You might want to ask somebody who's already doing the thing you want to do, and it's. That's good leadership advice, period. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Bill, it's been a pleasure and honor, sir. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. I've really genuinely enjoyed our conversation. I really appreciate what you're doing and the message you're putting across, and I think it's vitally important. Um, you know, again, 
I'm not shy about saying I am very anti-war. I would never sign up for the military. You'd have to torture me. It would never happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have the Im- an immense amount of respect for people who serve. And I always want to do everything I can to help them. And I do work separately from what everybody knows about to help vets. Um, so whether this is a philosophical argument or a non-philosophical argument, the bare bones of it is if you want to say thank you for your service and you're in a leadership position, the way to serve is to make sure those expectations become real and that you're willing to take the time and invest the time in training those people up because they do deserve our help. They do deserve our our, our, our service. They, they are serving in the way they served, and now you can serve in the way that you serve. It's been a pleasure and honor, sir. Again, before we finish, please tell everybody, make sure they know where to find out about you, where to find out about the book. And again, if you didn't catch part one and you just got to the end of this part two, go back and listen to part one. It's full of gems. I promise you, you'll love the conversation. Bill, tell us more. Thank you very much. WilliamToti.com, T-O-T-I is the way the last name is spelled. And the book is available everywhere, Amazon, Kindle, ebook, Apple Books, and on audiobook for both uh, Audible and Apple audiobooks. So thanks. It's been a pleasure, Dove. Really appreciate you having me. Thank you, sir. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. And for you, dear listener, remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders and you can chat about this episode or any past episodes inside of our groups on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Remember, those who control the meaning for the tribe also control the movement of that tribe. You know, like Bill was saying earlier, you know, if you're a military person, they need to know the mission. That's meaning. So you can tap into our groundbreaking understanding of how to apply the anatomy of meaning extracted from the emotional source code of individuals and organizations, even nations, and understand the behavioral profiling and persuasion and influence techniques that come from that. I'm Dov Barron. I show businesses, teams, and leaders how to harness their emotional source code to move their tribe because unified actualized meaning is the one single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for all individuals and companies. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friends. Stay curious about how you are not just saying thank you for your service, but you are demonstrating thank you for your service. It comes in the way that you hire and your expectations around that hiring to make sure that they match and that you're willing and committed to serving the person who served you so that they can succeed in life. I'm Dolph Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.